Well, another month has passed and that means that it is Q&A time here again on the channel. Uh, just yesterday, I put up a community post here on YouTube to collect some of your questions. So thanks to everyone who did ask a question for this Q&A video. Uh, I try to do these about once a month and I always collect the questions via a community post here on YouTube. So um, if you wanna get a question potentially in a future Q&A video, just turn your notifications on here on YouTube. That way you should be notified anytime I upload a new video or when I put up a new community post and that way you can get in quick and, and ask your questions. So um, that is the plan for this video, but before we get into that, we do have a sponsor and this video is sponsored by Hatch. Hatch is the platform I personally use for all of my US investing for me as a Kiwi based here in New Zealand and Hatch is asking you to think about what your big and small tomorrow goals look like. For me, the goal has always been financial freedom, putting a little bit away today with the aim being that I can do the things that I want to do tomorrow. Everyone's tomorrow looks different, whether you want to buy your ultimate dream car, travel the world or become financially independent, reaching your goals starts by taking the first step. That's why I invest with Hatch to help make my plans a reality and if you want to get started investing with Hatch, check out the first link in the description below where you can get a free 20 New Zealand dollar top up when you make your first deposit of 100 New Zealand dollars or more before the 31st of December 2022. Okay, so first question here is from Caljo. Uh, what do you think will happen with the price of SRG stock once they start paying out proceeds from sales? Thank you for all the content, love it. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. That is a very, very good question. Uh, if you're not familiar with Seritage, um, hopefully you are by this point, but they are basically going through the process of liquidating all the real estate holdings, paying back all the debt, and then um, paying all the remaining proceeds out to shareholders. That's kind of what's happening with Seritage. They're gonna go through that liquidation process. And um, you know, if they're successful in that, eventually Seritage stock will basically go to zero. That's kind of how this is gonna work. Their plan is to turn all of their net assets basically into cash, and then they will distribute that cash out over time. So um, let's just say for argument's sake that um, the net asset value for Zeritage is say $20 per share, um, if they pay out $5 per share as a cash distribution to shareholders, the stock in theory should go down to 15 and they will just follow that process all the way down to uh, close to zero. I think a good case study is probably going to be the Luby's liquidation. That was actually, um, uh, John Gorelli was a key player in that and he's now the chief financial officer at Seritage Growth Properties. Um, and it will be very interesting when Seritage gets to the point where they are no longer listed on the stock exchange. So I would recommend recommend doing some reading on what happened with the Lubies kind of liquidating trust in that example. It is very possible that Seritage will still have some net assets left over that will take a little more time to kind of sell and um, distribute the final proceeds and they may uh, kind of come off the stock exchange when they convert to that liquidating trust uh, entity. So that will be something to read about I think if you go through some of the press releases on the Lubies uh, website you should be able to track kind of how that flow happened but uh, yeah long story short the more cash that Seritage starts to pay out um, the closer the stock will go to zero so your you know share market value you know your holding of of those shares will go down over time and the cash in your pocket hopefully will go up over time so that is that is the general idea of Seritage. Uh, next question is from Alamad. If interest rates are like gravity to stocks, then uh, why have stocks and bonds been negatively correlated historically? Uh, yeah, sure. So I guess um, interest rates being gravity to stocks is basically all about um, your range of alternative investment opportunities at any given point in time. So if bonds are paying you 10%, you're going to have to get more than a 10% return in stocks, which would imply quite a low valuation for the stock market. Whereas if bonds, you know, you can only get 2%, that would mean that the hurdle for you to get invested in stocks is much lower and stocks therefore will tend to have a much higher valuation. Um, the reason that historically stocks and bonds have been negatively correlated, so in other words, when stocks go down, bonds tend to go up, is because generally when stocks are going down, we're going through some sort of down cycle economically and corporate earnings are low, maybe we're going into a recession, and that's really what's driving um, kind of stock prices down. And typically when that happens, Federal Reserves will drop interest rates, which tend to make the value of bonds go up. So that's the, the general theory at least. Um, this latest cycle that we're in at the moment seems to be a 
little different where uh, interest rates were effectively already pinned at zero which has meant that there's been this huge bull market for a long time in bonds and there's also been a huge bull market for a long time now in stocks actually because um, like you say interest rates are like gravity on stocks and we haven't had a whole lot of gravity <laughs> in terms of interest rates in the past decade or so. But this is an interesting example where interest rates are going up to try and stop inflation. So um, that forces bond values down and it also forces uh, stock prices down. So um, this is a slightly unusual example I guess where we're certainly at some extremes in terms of where where interest rates were but that's the general principle about why stocks and bonds are typically negatively correlated but of course it's not always the case in 2022 we've had both stocks and bonds coming down uh, generally speaking so uh, thanks for your question next question is from uh, immortal synergy from the green gates to the a-frame uh, life related question but how do you keep te temptation at a minimum uh, when do you treat yourself what do you consider before making a big purchase 250 dollars and up um, yeah, this has been an interesting one for me recently. So um, let me talk about before we purchased a house quite recently, and I guess since we've done that. Um, before we purchased a house, I would go through the pretty classic like pay yourself first setup where I would have a few different bank accounts. Um, money would you know hit my main kind of daily checking account when I uh, get paid from my day job or from YouTube or whatever it is and I would have a set amount that I funnel towards savings and long-term investments every single time and essentially whatever's left over I would use to um, pay bills or you know spend money on fun stuff basically um so that's the way I generally did it. I was pretty disciplined around that. Like I would have, um, you know, an annual savings target and I would be able to break that down and say, that means I need to save, you know, this amount each fortnight when I get paid, for example. Um, and I stuck to that pretty strictly. There were certainly times where um, I had a little bit of cash built up, um, you know over and above the pay yourself first kind of thing and that's typically when i would uh, take some money to spend but things do come up from time to time you know christmas and birthdays and um, maybe we save up for a holiday or, or whatever it is so um, that's the way i tend to structure it now that we're in the house and we've got regular uh, debt repayments and so on, it's a little different, but um, very similar structure. So I get paid each fortnight um, and then we have a set amount that goes towards repaying debt and, and so on. Um, and again, I'm just trying to live on what's left over, but there's been a lot of big purchases recently with uh, furniture and all, all sorts of stuff to kind of fill the house that we've just moved into. But um, that's the way I generally structure it. Um, yeah, from time to time I do splash out a little bit, but um, I do try to be reasonably strict on the whole thing. And, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, there's not a lot of stuff that I want that I don't already have, I guess. Like, um, you know, I enjoy fishing in my spare time. I've got some reasonably high-end, like, fishing gear that I've spent money on over the years. Um, sure, it'd be nice to do more fancy holidays or whatever, but um, for the most part, I've got everything I need and, um, you know, major purchases aren't going to materially add to my happiness in life, I suppose. So um, very good question. It's There's a lot of personal preference in that type of stuff, but that's the way I've, I've tended to structure it. Uh, next one is from uh, Eleanor Churtner, <laughs> hopefully I'm saying that right. Hey Tom, uh, f wanted to first thank you for all the hard work and content you provide us. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, will you be willing to share some more research on new companies in the future like you did in the past, for example, uh, like you did on Thor and Alibaba, etc.? Also, you talked about opportunity cost uh, in the channel before. Can you give us a few examples from your journey? I think I understand it theoretically, uh, but a few examples will be nice. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm more than happy to share different you know, companies I'm researching and stuff on the channel here. I do have to be a little careful. Uh, the FMA here in New Zealand, for example, um, has pretty strict rules around what um, people can and can't say on um, public forums like this. So uh, as long as I'm sticking to factual information and all that type of stuff, and I'm not saying go out and buy the stock now or anything crazy like that, which I would never do, um, then then I should be good. And um, yeah, more than happy to, to share things like that in future as they come up. Um, in terms of opportunity cost, I'm not sure exactly what you're referencing about what I've mentioned on it before. Um, 
I guess I'm always trying to stack up investment alternatives against one another. Like, um, you know, a lot of people talk about weighted average cost of capital and stuff when valuing businesses, whereas Buffett and Munger would talk about, um, you know, more through an opportunity cost lens where um, your second best idea is kind of the hurdle for making your investments and stuff. So um, if that's what you're getting at, that's kind of the way I still think about it. Um, There's definitely been companies that I've missed in the past that I probably should have bought, like I knew enough to buy them um, and have created sort of mistakes of omission. I know that's something Buffett and Munger talk about a lot as well. Um, Not sure if that exactly answers your question. Maybe let me know down in the comment section below if you were thinking about about that through a slightly different lens and I'll, I'll see if I can answer it there but um, thanks for your questions uh, next one's from Jack Re- uh, question regarding Hingham uh, Hingham Institution for Savings I was wondering if you had figured out how they are able to get such low borrowing borrowing rate with the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston I understand they put up loans as collateral but in the last quarter they were getting the loan at 1.79% for, from the advance uh, this is considerably under the Fed rate I read that they only need to slightly lend out above the bond rate but I'm unsure further as interest rates rise will it only be their deposits impacted high rates to customers are pinching net interest margin rather than their federal home loan of Boston Lines. Yeah, um, I did do a bit of digging before this video just on this question. So I think the 1.79% figure you're seeing, if you were to compare that same figure in a previous 10Q or even in like an annual report um, from the last year or so, that number would be much lower. And looking at the um, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston rates most recently, they're now more in like the 4 to 5% range. They've definitely come up a lot. But um, it's basically just a time thing, you know. Hingham are taking that money and locking in rates, um, you know, over a one, two, three year period. All of that's in the annual and quarterly reports. It'll show you um, kind of the duration over which that those loans are structured. So I think it's just a time lag thing. The rates are certainly higher than that today, but I don't think that's fully th- kind of flowing through to Hingham just yet. Um, the rates got down to like under half a percent or right around half a percent, uh, depending on the duration at, at one point only a year or so ago. So um, that number is definitely lifting. Um, Hingham very much are like a liability sensitive bank. So anytime interest rates go up like they are at the moment, there's going to be a lag between them being able to uh, between them having to pay more on their uh, interest-bearing liabilities and then uh, them being able to kind of funnel that through to getting more interest on the loans that they're writing. So there is a time lag there and that will hurt Hingham in the short term if interest rates are rising sharply or if the yield curve is quite flat. Um, And we're seeing kind of both of those things at the moment. That's probably a reason why Hingham's stock price is down so much this year. Um, But it works the other way as well. So when interest rates drop away, uh, there's a lag between, um, you know, them not having to pay as much interest on their deposits and so on, and them, uh, you know, having to offer lower, lower interest rates through their loan products to customers. So it works both ways, but um, that, that 1.79% I expect will come up probably pretty dramatically in the next few quarters. Next question here is from uh, UFC YAJ. Hi Tom, which mental models have you used for making investment decisions? Um... Yeah, all sorts of stuff, I guess. Um, there's there's the old saying from from Munger. I think it might have been Mark Twain actually that said initially. But uh, to a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and uh, it's very useful to have lots of different ideas up in your in your mental toolkit, you know, uh, upstairs. So um, yeah, all all different types of things. I don't know that I can put any particular mental models out there. You just try to learn all sorts of things from a range of different fields and merge those ideas together to kind of think through problems in the most efficient manner so um, that's that's kind of how how I think about it but um, I, I really do like Munger's idea of learning all of the big disciplines I think I had a lot of that through my education already like I, I studied a lot of different science and mathematics uh, topics through high school and university and so on so I think that was actually quite a big help the more I look back at it I didn't get super specialized particularly uh, early on uh, in my education or, or career or anything so um yeah, that, that's how I sort of think about it. Question here from Ronnie. Hi, Tom. Love your content. Thank you very much. Uh, question one. Since we never know where the bottom of a price drop in a stock or a market is, uh, what is your way to buy a stock? Do you purchase in tranches? 
yeah, this is kind of something I've I've changed here and there over time. But the general idea is I will um, purchase in um, in chunks. I won't typically um, allocate a full position immediately, like right out of the gate. Some of that is just um, kind of what you're getting at here, making sure that if the price falls, I've still got um, cash I can allocate and so kind of a position in the portfolio I can allocate to that same stock at lower prices. Part of it's that. Um, the other part of it, you know, I've just kind of learning over time that you really can build uh, more conviction and learn more about the business after you own it. So um, there's actually, I find quite a mental advantage in just buying a kind of starter position in companies first off and then adding to it either as the price goes down or as you you learn more about the business and become comfortable with it so usually now that looks like you know at least kind of two purchases maybe as many as three or four and i typically have kind of price targets in mind um, but you've also got to be careful not to fall into the trap of averaging down over and over and over and over again. Um, I've been quite wary not to do that with a company like Alibaba, for example, whereas I've seen a lot of people get super probably over allocated to that particular stock as it's come down, you know, in an effort to average down their price. And at a certain point, you have to, um, you know, have a bit of a ceiling for, for what kind of allocation you'll give to any particular company. So um, that, that's where I'm at with that one. Uh, question two, have you tried purchasing a stock by selling puts? Uh, I think I would be afraid of the stock price uh, not reaching the option level and therefore not getting enough stocks at the price I'm happy at. Uh, yeah, I, I've never done that. I, I um, need to look more into that. There's some weird tax things here in New Zealand. I just need to be a bit, bit cautious of around options. So I haven't done it yet, but um, you know, hopefully if you're not get, getting put the shares, you're still getting a pretty good annualized return on the option premium, you know, in the 20 to 30 percent range, I think is what Matt Peterson, for example, is getting on, on a lot of the option ideas that, that he's writing. So uh, next question uh, from Anton, can you share more about your latest investment? I believe it was a small bank company, the thesis and reasoning. Yeah, I think I covered this in the previous Q&A I did on the channel, but it's Hingham Institution for Savings, um, not intended to be a stock tip at all. Um, but it's a business I like. I spoke about it earlier in the video with a question there. And, um, you know, it's a small, very well run bank, which has a um, very slim kind of focus and circle of comp competence, I guess. They do um, commercial and residential real estate lending, and that's more or less it. Um, you know, I think something like 30% of the bank is owned by insiders, and it's very well run, got a good track record. I think it can probably compound book value at a very reasonable rate. Um, they'll pay dividends if they, you know, get to certain leverage ratios to kind of squeeze some capital out of the business. It's trading at a lower multiple of book than it has done uh, in the past, and uh, I think it can still grow for a long time yet. So um, it's a modest sized position. It's not super small, but it's not super big either. Um, I would probably add to it at lower prices, but again, do your own work on it, and and that's kind of where I'm at with it. It's just, it's very unlikely to be like a 5x in five years or anything crazy or you know 100 bagger unless i hold it for an extremely long time but i think it can offer a reasonable rate of return and um yeah i kind of like the the downside upside odds here okay let's do one last question from joey uh feel free to disregard my other question <laughs> i will but i did see that that was funny uh many value investors i see talk about buybacks more than dividends and for great reason high buyback uh, can be a similarly poor use of capital just like a dividend just like a high dividend yet i see value investors seek out cannibals like it is the best thing uh, often an amazing thing question is are value investors justified in being impartial to repurchase programs um yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons people tend to favor share buybacks, particularly in a place like the US. One is they're more tax efficient because um, when a company makes money, they pay tax on those profits. If they dividend out that money, uh, the shareholder then pays tax on that dividend income. We actually don't have that problem in New Zealand uh, and Australia doesn't have that problem either. They have a franking system. Uh, we call it a dividend imputation system where I get a basically a tax credit on any dividends paid from a New Zealand company. So we kind of avoid that double taxation that makes buybacks less, far less popular in Australia and New Zealand than they are in the US. Um, but that's one reason. The other reason is obviously if you can purchase shares 
you know, if you can purchase in shares below intrinsic value, that is um, kind of a creative for long-term shareholders. Can also be value destructive if you uh, repurchase shares above intrinsic value. And Bonus Pabri did a really good talk on this recently, actually talking about Uber Cannibals. Uh, and he gave a few examples of companies where it's worked really well, and then a few examples of companies where it hasn't worked very well, where, you know, the underlying business is deteriorating, um, the intrinsic value of the company is going down year after year after year and um, funneling a lot of money into share repurchases has not been that good for long-term shareholders. They probably would have been better either investing more in their underlying business to try and salvage it or um, to just to just kind of pay a dividend. So I think oftentimes um, some investors can be a bit... Um, you know, uh, over optimistic on repurchases. Although generally speaking, you know, if you like a company as a long-term investment, you think the business is getting better and you think the share price is attractive, probably buybacks are going to be much better for long-term shareholders than an efficiently taxed dividends and the like. So those are all the questions we have time for. Thank you very much to everyone who did ask a question. Uh, like I say, if you want to ask a question in a future Q&A video, um, just check out the uh, community post that I put up uh, around this time next month collecting your questions. But um, like I say, that's it from me today, and I'll see you on the next video. Cheers.